Having seen all of that, what was the process flow, what, how we did it, uh, how did we compound it and all of that, these were some uh, pointers which came out of the first round of processing these materials. Uh, especially with the extrusion, like I mentioned, the PLA had to be suppressed in terms of processing temperature by using PEG, which is a common industry plasticizer. And uh, what was observed as compounding was any material which was compounded with DDGs or stover processed really well. At injection molding, the same thing was observed that uh, most of these alloys and as well as composites processed well and we have certain theories for it, especially the ones with DDGs processed well. Um, and uh, when we started using off-the-shelf Mirella, which is not available right now, at that time, two years ago, we were able to get hold of a lot of their uh, various branded products, but now their production has stopped. So at that time, the materials actually showed a lot of sink marks. Uh, tooling had to be maintained very well. You had to, it was very finicky. You had to maintain a good uh, tool core and cavity temperature and so on. So with that, this from this section on, it should be actually Kenny who should be talking because he's going to be in the slides mostly uh, to talk about dip coating. Um, so during our first round, we had four main uh, candidates for dip coating. One was polyurethane, which is what Sammy talked about, which was a water-based polyurethane and was one of the easiest to process because it did not require any sort of OSHA or EHNS clearance. It was basically a water-based one, friendly to use in a lab, no issues. When we went on to PLA and tongue oil and polyamide, our primary solvent for dispersion was chloroform. And um, it was not a very merry time in all of our lives. We actually had to wear masks all the time. We were mistaken for aliens at times, but yeah, it was mostly Kenny who did it, so no, I would credit to him. <laughs> yeah, the PLA, talking about the polyamide, was a nightmare. I mean, the chloroform just complicated everything. Uh, the tongue oil was especially difficult due to an added catalyst. Uh, so overall, the polyurethane was the easiest and it's the cheapest because you didn't have to use the expensive organic salt. And that's the reason why we carried over the polyurethane into round two, whereas all the others were dropped out. So the process was basically simple, like Sammy showed in schematics. We took the pot, dip coated it, hung it up in a you know garage made hanger sort of thing, and then threw it in an incubator at 40 degrees Celsius for about I want to say six or eight hours. The drying was conducted. And you, at oftentimes, I think during the first round, we also did double coating. Yes, yeah, so the first round, yeah. everything has uh, two coats. So, so that being said, uh, like we already discussed, uh, polyurethane, the only issue was it had longer uh, drying times. It was lower coverage compared to the other coatings. PLA, of course, there was quick drying time, but yes, uh, you had to have safety requirements for it. Handling chloroform is not a very green thing. Um, so, and similarly, tongue oil was done in a similar environment, but once the pot was processed or the fiber pot was processed, uh, during storage, we saw some of the tongue oil was not catalyzed and it started leaching out as the storing or the storage room temperature was going up. So, that was some of the observations what we had. Geez, I'm burning through real fast. Should I slow down? Because all I got is another four or five slides. So, um, okay. Um, now, during uh, what the project outline said was during our round two, we would actually dwindle down the list of 30 to 15. But once again, uh, we had more coffee and more cookies in the room. And uh, we pumped it up to 25 materials overall, but of course it was just 18 or 19 materials per pot size, which would be the four and a half inch and then the gallon type. Um, so with that, I don't have much to report in terms of processing flow charts, nothing much changed except for processability because 
this time around the percentage of the soy or the DDGs which were included were changed and what we did was we sat down and said okay how could we quantitatively define how each of these materials performed and we basically came up with the scale for performance in terms of processing and we divided it into two scales one which would rate the compounding process from 0 to 100, 100 being the best and uh, 0 being the worst and a similar way to injection molding and if I can go a little bit I mean I'll briefly go through extrusion because there was not much to report but again like we mentioned earlier any blends as well as or alloys or composites actually performed well especially ones with lignin or DDGs you can see we gave it a higher rating because we did not have much of preparation to do with those materials and it was pretty much mix dump and extrude process whereas with the soy and the other ones though uh, we had really great results with the greenhouse trials uh, they did have an extra compounding step and that's why we had to give it a lower uh, rating in terms of uh, processability at extrusion. Uh, similarly for PHA it was the same case you can see the one with the DDG scored higher but this time around what I should note is first year we actually got the off the shelf PHA resins or myrel resins. Second year they were almost in their down um, I think they were in the downturn of bringing down the production and moving all the technology to Spain. So what they had to offer was the virgin resin. Um, now the virgin resin is basically the resin which came out of the catalytic process which was not compounded with any of the nucleating agent or the additive packages and such. So we got the virgin resin uh, and the reason for that is one is they did not have off the shelf uh, materials in stock. Second is it was also suggested that using that base resin would actually increase the binding capacity so that that way we could increase our loading percentage of DDGs or soy and it would bind those materials a lot better. Um, so we gave some numbers for those um, and in terms of injection molding you can see that again the materials with fillers especially the lignin one scored really well because of one reason if people might be surprised to see that uh, we actually gave polypropylene 95 in theory that should have been the benchmark uh, to compare with but um, why we gave lignin 20 percent with PLA 100 was because it was able to withstand a higher temperature range so you could push the temperature processing window by almost 50 degrees up and down and it would still withstand those temperature ranges because and our theory on it is because lignin has a lot of aromatic compounds in it which innately are thermally stable so and we thought that's the reason why it made the material more resilient to temperature range and that way we were able to increase the flow and we were able to come up with thin wall materials and it molded well overall and if you look at the other ones especially the composite ones processed way better um, and these indices actually include various other things like what sort of uh, mold temperature you had to use which translates to amount of energy used at injection molding process and on and on so with, with that uh, that's more pictures of Kenny extruding this material um, and I'd also like to thank some of our molding partners who were quite patient with us you know when you bring in an experimental material into their molding floor shop you know things don't go your way all the time things get bad and uh, both the both our partners which are R&D molders and mid-continent were quite supportive of us and uh, they accommodated most of our requests and as I'd like to thank Aspen for giving some materials as well and overall of course I have to thank USDA for giving us the funding on this. <laughs>